God, you are God, Elohim. We say, ancient of days, Lord, reign. There is none, there is none like you, Lord. Ancient of days, reign. Ancient of days, ancient of days, Lord, reign, Lord, reign. Ancient of days, ancient of days, reign, reign. We praise thy name, thy name. Oh Lord, oh we praise your name, we praise, Lord we praise, thy name oh Lord, oh we praise, thy name oh Lord, oh we praise thy name. Thy name, O oh Lord, Father, we praise your name, we praise, Lord, we praise thy name, thy name, O oh Lord, we praise your name, we praise, Lord, we praise thy name, O oh Lord. We praise thy name, O oh Lord. Oh, we praise thy name, O oh Lord. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, 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 amen. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, amen. Oh, hallelujah, 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 amen. Oh, God, hallelujah, hallelujah, amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. 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 We sing Ale, Ale, Hallelujah. Amen. Ale, Hallelujah. Amen. We say, Awesome God, how great thou art. You are God, you are God, mighty are your, me, your miracles, we stand in awe of your holy name, Lord we bow down. We bow and worship you, holy are you, Lord, holy, 
Holy are you, Lord, all creation, all creation, they call you God. Worthy, worthy is your name, worthy is your name, we worship you, God. We worship your majesty, awesome God, awesome God, awesome God, how great thou art, you alone are God, you are God, mighty I am me. Your miracles, we stand in awe of your holy name. Lord, we bow down, we bow and worship you. We say, Awesome God, Awesome God, how great you are. You alone are God. You are God mighty. I am me, your miracles. We stand in awe of your holy name. Lord, we bow down. We bow and worship you, Lord, we bow, Lord, we bow, we bow and worship. From the rising of the sun, so it's going down, Lord, we bow and worship. In the morning, day and night, Lord, we bow. And worship every day we breathe, Lord. We say, Lord, we bow, we bow and worship in our going out and our coming in, Lord. We bow, we bow and worship, Lord. We bow down, Lord. We bow, we bow and worship. We bow down and worship you, Lord. We bow and worship. We bow down on our knees and say, Lord, we bow. We bow and worship. Lord, we bow down. Lord, we bow. And worship you. Well, you're welcome. Father, let the words of our hearts and the meditations of our heart be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So you're welcome back. And thank you very much for your, your resilience and your staying power. And uh, we still are grateful to God for the opportunity to share concerning fatherhood and sonship one of the potent foundations of, of godliness and of the kingdom, particularly in this age where we are part of the end times. And um, we need to be really preparing for the intense occurrings and, and um, unravelings that Jesus prophesied. So time is valuable, I mean valuably spent when we sit under grace to hear wisdom from God. And like I always want to remind you, a father is F-A-T-H-E-R. A father is a figure that is anointed to train you so you handle eternal realities. So if you take it as an acronym, you get the figure, anointed, training, the handling, and then eternal realities. Fatherhood is nothing short of this. Eternal reality, at the peak of eternal realities, is accountability. Because it is God alone that is sovereign. So the reality of eternal realities or the peak, the zenith of eternal realities is accountability. That is why when eternity unfolds, the thing is a judgment unto condemnation and a judgment unto rewards. Are you understanding me? So accountability is engaged because of purpose and empowerment. 
God doesn't create anything and give life to something, he will not empower and judge. So that is it. So when you have a father, he should be someone that is preparing you for the big element of the kingdom, which is accountability. Because sovereignty creates because of purpose and assessment. God gave you life because he had the design for your life. And at the end of your life, he will assess you according to the tenets of the design. So a father is a figure that is anointed to train you so you handle eternal realities. And he's anointed to train because he must have the wisdom and should have gone through the occurrences that can mold him to handle your unique upbringing. So when you meet a father, the Bible makes us understand that he will be able to give you the tutelage that will put you in the regions of maturity for the birthing of destiny. So always put that at the back of your mind. You know there are people that get to a point and they say, oh, as for me, I don't really have a father and, um, you know, it's because I, I respond to some few systems and there, there, there's a way I do my things or there's a way things are done at the sphere. If you ever, I, I don't judge anybody and honestly, in the kingdom, fatherhood is for maturity more than it is for credibility. You can be saved without a spiritual father. It's very possible. Are you understanding me? If people normally say the person who preaches to you is your spiritual father, and then they could fall in, I think it's First Corinthians, uh, you know, and then um, uh, four, he was saying, though you have 10,000 instructors, yet ye have one father, because in Christ I have begotten you by the gospel. It is a kind of fatherhood because of a play with the nomenclature. So, so Paul is trying to say there is a begetting process and whatever that process is, I use the word of God. Not simply that because I preach the word of God, I'm your father. That's not a simplistic interpretation of that scripture. What that scripture really means is that there is a certain process called begetting where the, the, the Lord uses you to produce a certain you know, effect on a person's life. And whatever that process entails, I use the word of God in Christ to do it. So there is a way... Um, God uses you to preach to somebody. As you are here, if God uses you to preach to somebody and the person is saved, it is God that becomes the father of that person, not you. Praise the Lord. So, I mean, these are foundational things that I always want to remind people about. You don't judge anybody because they don't have a spiritual father. Because in the kingdom, fatherhood is for the element of maturity. So, and then, and cre but not... For credibility i know people who say oh until i know your spiritual father you are not, i can't even tell whether you are saved or whatever no please you don't judge people to that angle but then i always want to remind people if you ever get to the point as a human being where you conclude that there is nobody under the sun who is greater than you and can lay hands on you that is proof that you are in error it's proof that you are in error even in the old testament under the blood of bulls and goats God could tell Elijah, I have seven people who operate, 7,000 people who operate like you. How much more in the New Testament? You can never get to a point where you say, oh, you know, where God has lifted us to around this level, you know, you can't have any man you will submit to, so you relate to God directly and all sort of things. No, all these dodgy things, eventually you will meet the master and in the eyes of eternity, you will realize how insignificant you are you must always have a humble view that there is somebody who god can say has more wisdom than you he told saul i have found the neighbor of thine that is better than thou in the eyes of the divine he will have you he can find somebody that is better than you so you don't get to a point where you say i'm so big i'm so established you know the extent to which god has elevated us that's why I like the, the book, um, the writer of Hebrews. He said in Hebrews chapter, chapter 3, I guess, Wherefore, heavenly brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, now consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful in all his house, as also Moses was faithful in all, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who had built the house had more honor than the house. 
That's what God was saying. Even Moses, Jesus came and was so glorious more than Moses. Are you understanding me? As though, as in, in much the same way that a man who builds a house has more honor than the house. Then you go to Hebrews chapter 7, I, I believe. And the Bible makes us understand that Melchizedek was higher than Abraham. And so I think, well, if, if, you, if you read it, you will understand. And um, for consider, I think Hebrews chapter 7 verse 4, I guess. For consider how much greater this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. I, I, is it there? Hebrews chapter 7 verse 1. Yeah, now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of all the spoils. And then if you go to, I think, verse 6, he said, but he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Is that what it's written? Yes. Yeah. So even Abraham met somebody greater than him. You can't live under the sun and say there is nobody that the level you have gotten to who is better than you. The Bible says, and verily they that are of the sons of Levi have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. So even Abraham met Melchizedek. And the Bible says he was as inestimably higher than Abraham to the point he could take tithe from Abraham. And even though Abraham had the blessing of God under oath, he still was able to bless him. Never get to the point where you think that you have gotten so mature that you can't find anybody to submit to. That is proof that you are in error. And uh, it won't help you. Praise the Lord. Great. So now we'll, we'll give room for questions and answers. Please ask easy questions so that... Uh, we can. <laughs> good morning or yes. afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, afternoon. God bless you. Um, so thank you for uh, everything. It's, um, I wrote down the, okay. You mentioned the oil, the kiss, and the word. Yes. Um, and I, I think you might have addressed this towards the end, but just to ensure that I'm Okay. Correct. Um, my question is, is there, so first, is there an order, like the way that he um, did it, is there an order mm -hmm. that they have to come um, to, um, do, do all of these things have to come from the same person? So, yeah, is it possible that you get maybe the oil from someone and then the kiss from someone else and then the word from someone else and how do you, how would you identify which one or are none of them and so you're just waiting for the one who um who is um yeah those are the two okay ones. right that's a good question so in first samuel chapter 10 the bible says then samuel took the vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said is it not because the the lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance and i spoke of three highways the oil the kiss and then the word and she's asking whether there is a specific order in which it must occur a lot of the time, kingdom principles, it is very difficult to state them in a, in a rigid methodology because Jesus says of the things of the Spirit in John chapter 3 that the wind bloweth where it listed, but no one knows where it is coming from nor where it is going. And so are the, the, so are the people that are born of the Spirit. So a lot of the times, spiritual things are mentioned in exclusion for mentioning sake you might not want to be so much rigid about the order it is like about salvation the Bible, so some people say you repent first then you believe then you you accept then and then so at the point in time you are regenerate then from there you are this but when you look at it critically and somebody says the sinner's prayer and god saves him you can't even tell at what point they've got into in the methodology so a lot of the times we safely infer an inspired progression especially um, going by how the bible literally exegetically lists it so if the oil came first and then the case and then you know the word we stick to this 
principle and this orderly manner. Then we go to other places in the Bible and go and find out where the principles of the oil or the gate of acceptance or ordained pronouncements are. And then we go and see whether there is an arrangement that is antithetical. If there is an arrangement that is opposite, then we get to realize that God is not particular about the order, the ordinal sense. But if there is an arrangement that tallies with this one, and the ordinal representation is equal to this, then we are getting confirmation that God is particular about the order. So at this point, I would want to just say, um, on like a, more like a humble or on a mild authority, that the oil must come first, and then the case, and then the ordained you know, word or the pronouncement. Because of course, if you are not anointed, why should people accept you? We are not accepting your personality because the Bible says the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. So if I accept you for your personality and the skill you have developed in the canal, the Bible says even the foolishness of spiritual things is still higher than what you will give me. So we would want to accept that the oil must come first, at least with the exegetical ordinal representation. And so the oil came first, then the case. If I am anointed, then there is reason for God to make people accept me. And then when people accept me, for what are they accepting me? For the empowerment to become what God sent me to be to them. So you stick to, the, to it like that. A lot of the times, like you're saying, will you get these three things from one point? Um, excuse me, just check the, the airflow part for me. So the very good question is, is it, are you supposed to get all these things from from one person, or you might have to get them from different places. The bad thing of it must be from one person. The bad thing of it must be from one person. The nurturing of it might be from many people. So then Paul says, I have begotten you in Christ by the gospel, and yet it is possible for you to have 10,000 instructors. So when I get the oil, and it is bad in me by my father, a lot of people might come around me who will polish the use of the oil. So they become many functionally, not essentially. The constituting essence of the oil, the kiss and the word, it must come from the womb of the father, one man. And that's why I told you that when David was going to the palace, it was Jesse that gave him all the three gifts. The oil... I mean, the, the bottle of wine, the loaf of bread, and then the kid. So it is always from one man. If you can get it like this, it's okay. So if you read, I think the First Corinthians um, um, 4 from 16, then Paul says, because I have begotten you, I beseech you that you follow me. Follow me. A lot of people can instruct you for you to be functionally better, but essentially the, the womb that bear you forth is one. And I always like to stick to that. So he are not, um, you are bad from one source, and then a lot of people come on board to um, functionally fine-tune what you have been bad with. Has that been helpful? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yes, yeah. hallelujah. Yeah, Papa, please, I have a question in relation with uh, your biological father and your spiritual father. Yes. Okay, so in my case... Um, uh, I would say that I, it's just recently that I have received this insight that you need to really honor your biological father as you are honoring your spiritual father. Yes. But in this case, uh, my biological father is deceased. So how do I reconcile this and then make sure, uh, I don't know, like honor him and then as I do to my spiritual father? Right. That's great. In the kingdom, the essence of the high priestly you know, function is that it must have tolerance for men that are out of the way and men that are ignorant. So the reason why Jesus is a high priest is that he knows that people will come to the knowledge of what they must know at a later time. And people will exhibit ignorance and people will be out of the way. So when you realize at the advent of truth that you have wasted the years in error and you did not know, then you appeal directly to the high priestly function of Jesus. And you ask him that by his intercession, the errors of the past be not laid as a charge against you. When you pray that prayer and the heavens have accepted that you are genuinely broken, then of course, God will begin to lead you as to 
who you give honor to at this point in your life for those biological, um, um, you know, tutelage that your father should have done. I don't know if you're understanding me. The Bible says if your father and if father and mother forsake you, who will be your father and mother? God. Is that not so? How will God be your father and mother? He will look for a representative. Just the same way that God looked for a biological person to give you birth on his behalf. When that flesh is diseased, he will look for another biological person that he will entrust. And he will bring that person to give you the function of what that person should have been in your life. And then you will show this honor to that person who is alive. I don't know if that is, if that is helping you. A lot of people say my biological father is dead. Your biological father is essentially dead. He cannot be functionally dead. That is the reason why God is called the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. When Abraham died, then he left it and went to Isaac. He said, my name is the God of Isaac. When Isaac died, then he left it, he left it and went to Jacob. He said, my name is the God of Jacob. So the reason why he immortalized that name as the God of the fathers, the Bible says it is specifically because for God is the God of the living and not of the dead. And so at the cessation of life of a biological person, he is just a representative of the intents of the highest. If that person passes, God will now, out of his own wisdom, lift up a potent representation of who that and then another person can be in the stead of that person. And it will be a blessing to you. Are you understanding me? When you are going to the altar for marriage and you are deceased, I mean, your, one of your parents are diseased. Do you go saying there's nobody there? No, the ordinance calls for the fact that therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and be clung to a woman. So the spiritual protocol in the eyes of God when he comes down as the officiator of that covenant, in his eyes, he is seeing a mother figure, a father figure, and a man who is living to a woman. This is something he has his own way of sustaining. And not even death is able to cause an, an, uh, you know, an interruption beyond remedy. Even if they pass on, God has his way of raising up a, a, another person who will come and play that role. And it will be a blessing to you. But when you know that you miss the season, there are people who dishonored their father until they exited into glory. There is a curse on your life, whether New Testament or Old Testament, tongue talking or hidden, there's a case. Because the protocol is that the, the eye that dishonored the father, the ravens of the air shall pluck out that eye. If your father died with you dishonoring him, in the realms of the spirit, the ravens that will pluck your eyes out, they are not dead. They are looking for you. So the Bible says, the curse that is causeless shall not come, but the one with the curse shall surely come. So when you realize that, ah, it's today I'm hearing this message, and you see the time is limited, so I cannot always tell you all these big things. Moses was not able to get 70 elders to meet God tangibly until Jethro came to give him counsel. You know why? Because around that time, his biological father was not around. And God had to make Jethro begin to play that biological father status. So he came to him and he says, you are my relative, man. And then, um, well, I'm a priest and I'm ahead of you, all right. But the real matter is that I'm concerned about you and your life and your health and your home and your marriage. How you are handling my daughter and your, your children and all. And I came to visit you and I realized that the way you are sitting in council for long hours. Moses, you will die, oh. And so let me give you counsel. He came from the angle of the biological. A lot of people like to hurriedly over-spiritualize everything. But when Jethro came into Moses' life to give him that biological or that paternal, literal paternal counsel, then God told him, choose some people and meet me up on the mountain. So you see, it was the biological influence of Jethro coupled with the spiritual influence that made Moses produce 70 people who ascended the mountain to meet God fili fili with him. Whatever that fili fili means, don't worry. English is not my mother tongue. Yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Are you understanding me? So it is critical. Moses got that level when Jethro came in. 
Njeto came in from the point of an in-law. He was a priest, all right, but he was from the point of an in-law. That is biological rend rendition. Elisha got it when Shaphat came in with Elijah. David got it when Jesse came in with Samuel. Saul got it when Kish came in with Samuel. What makes you think that you just need a spiritual father who is a prophet and that, that means you end up great in life? No, they will not be humble to tell you this because everybody wants people to come to them. Now, let me tell you one thing that maybe will help you. Let's leave it for another time. It will be better. Praise the Lord. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So look for your biological father and honor him. Uh, amen. <laughs> okay, thank you, Apostle. Yes. I want to ask, is it, the, is it a fault of Saul that he didn't receive the kid or the three loaves of bread and then the wine? Because um, it was like a word that Samuel gave to him. Yeah. But David received all. Yeah. yeah. Ev Everything that is under the sun is the play out of sovereign wisdom that has a place even for darkness. When light is moving and light wants to show supremacy, light shows supremacy by encroaching into the plans of darkness. So in the perfect will of God are, are injuries. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the wisdom of the divine is so pure and so infinite and so flawless that even pain has a place in the wisdom of God. Even pain. So when God is directing you and you see one, two, three unfortunate things and you say, whose fault is this? It means you don't understand the wisdom God is using. The wisdom of the Lord does not look for faults. It is sovereign and complete, even with darkness as an ingredient. So when you say, was it Saul's fault? No, it was not Saul's fault. Was it God's fault? It was not Saul's, uh, it was not God's fault. So whose fault was it? It was the person who did not value the wisdom's fault. So if it is Saul that did not value the wisdom, then it was Saul's fault. So if God calls you now and says, Jude, I'm, I'm asking you to go to some place. If it is your spiritual father, I mean, or let's say your biological father, he says, you're going to school. He will come. And he will say, what do you need in school? He will give you your provisions, right? Then he will give you your uniform. He will give you pocket money. And he will give you all these things. If God is sending you to school, he will give you your provisions. Then he will give you an empty job box. Then he will give you your school uniform. Then he will give you tattered rags. And then he will give you people who come and beat you. He will give you bullies. He will give you people who will come and lie to you. And you will say, now, my son, the things are complete. You can go to school. So when you get to school, you say, who put these started rags in my, in, my, in my bag? But then the wisdom of the Lord is so pure, it has a place even for darkness. So this is the wisdom under the sun. So when you get up and you say, whose fault is it that my father did not take care of me? Whose fault is it that when my mother gave birth to me, she abandoned me and ran away? No. Who's, if it depends on the wisdom you want to use. If you are using God's wisdom, even abandonment has a place. Even the manger has a place in the coming of the Lord of glory into humanity. So you cannot, you cannot be, be, be looking for faults now. Whose fault is it that somebody did not preach this message to you three years ago so that you would have honored your father before he died? Whose fault is it? There is nobody at fault. What makes you think that you hearing it now means there's somebody at fault? God ordained it that abandonment should come, that ignorance must come that people should deviate. And so he set up the high priestly function. So Hebrews chapter 5 from verse 1. For every high priest is taken from among men and ordained for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for, for sins who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he also himself is compassed with infirmity. So it is ordained that there be things that look like who is at fault. And God says, my wisdom has a high priestly function, even for deviation. So don't bother about who was at fault. Saul was not supposed to have said he was at fault. There was nothing he should have done around that time. The only thing was that he should have embraced the wisdom that God was comfortable with the fact that you do not get all these things at once. And he should have embraced the wisdom and humbly sought to get all the other ingredients. Has that been helpful? Right. God bless you. Yes. A follow-up. 
So, would it mean that maybe just in case? Yeah, just in case. Um, I probably might get one out of the three. Yes. Somebody might get three out of the three, and I'll not also be in error. Oh yes, not at all, okay. not at all, not at all. David committed more grievous errors than Saul. David murdered. He started with a lie. He took somebody's wife and murdered the guy intentionally. But then he was spared. And you know why he was spared? Because he had no honor to defend. Saul had a lot of honor to defend. When Saul eventually failed in 1 Samuel 15, and God came to tell him through the prophet Samuel that God has found a neighbor of thine that is better than you, and the kingdom is departed from you. Do you know what Saul told Samuel? He said, I beg you, you know, in the eyes of all these people, you can't disgrace me like that. Stay with me and let's do a worship service in the honor of God. Let's fool the people that I am still in office. God is only, the only one who will sack you from post and let you maintain your uniform. And he will only take the uniform the day you are dying, as he did to Aaron. The day he was going to kill Aaron was the day he told Moses, tell Aaron to remove the ecclesiastical regalia because... And then make uno. You know, that, that, that's it. So as for God, he will let you keep the clerical, let you keep all the sophisticated adornments and see if you have an ego to protect. Saul finished very tragically because he did not have a, he had an ego to protect. David committed worst offenses even though he had all these things. But then he was mindful with the fathers and with the instructors in his life. You come to a king and you come and tell him he's a murderer and he says, yeah, 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 I know, I know, I know. I know, so now what will God have us do? And Nathan says, me, myself, I don't know. He says, I said, then I won't eat anything again. And he announces his shortcomings to the whole palace. The king says he won't eat. Why? Ah, but you people, then, who, who, who you are hearing, it's true. He killed Uriah, and he has owned up. And he says he won't eat, to the point that when the child died, it is the people that came to announce to him. And they said, sir, the child is dead. They said, now, now let's eat. He said, ah, but when the child was rather alive, you were crying. He said, but now God has done what he, he has to do. Me, what can I do? I can't challenge him. So I'll rather side with it. So you see, David did not have an ego to protect. Saul had a lot of ego to protect. And it got to a point in time, Saul did not even know where Samuel was. But it was never the case with David. David always knew where to find Samuel. When Saul was threatening David, he ran to Samuel. At that point, David did not even know where Samuel was. At the point where Saul really lost the thing, eh? He used to come to where Samuel was and would not even look for him. It's all written in 1 Samuel if you keep reading on. It will shock you. He got to a certain point. He could even pass in the place where his father was and he said, Where is Saul? Oh, he was here some few minutes ago, but he has continued. And Samuel is the one asking where Saul is. You get to the place where the mouth that tutors and instructs you is now asking where you are. It's already proof you are lost. So you see, it was no fault of him. And you can get just one, and you end up better than those who got all three. Have nothing to protect that's in line with ego. Amen. Yes. Right. Okay. This is my question. First, thank you for the message. God bless okay. you. Um, in, in your delivery, you mentioned that um, the fact that Saul met a company of prophets did not mean he is a prophet. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so this is my question, practical case. There's a young man that's a spiritual father prophesied over him and released upon him the grace to preach and to write. Okay. Then in the course of that year, he gets the opportunity to meet two notable young authors yes. and preachers in this country. And then this, he takes this as a confirmation that oh, I'm part of this company. Right. Um, is, is his mindset erroneous or there's further protocol to confirm? To belong is not a problem. To now elevate the system to which you belong to have equal authority as the father is the problem so if these skilled authors begin to tell you we meet on sunday mornings and that's when we sharpen our writing gift and your spiritual father tells you i need you to be in church by sunday 6 a.m because i just want you to pray into the atmosphere before people come now you have a company of writers in line with prophetic destiny when they write, the Spirit of the Lord will come on you and you will write like them. But then they don't have the authority to determine what will happen to you after you write like them. So you don't give your life to them. The man with the womb is the one that can feed you for long. You see, nourishment is in two dimensions. When it is in the womb, it is with the placenta. When it is outside, it is with the breast. 
the company, <laughs> the company of prophets, the company of the anointed, they don't have the womb, so they can't nourish you to the placenta. The breast is not trans, transgenerational. The thing that connects you to your mother is the placenta, not the breast. So it is the father that can make you transgenerational. They will let you write now. You write three books. The only thing you will get is that the day you will do the, uh, what do you call the lunch, then you let people pay high for it. After that, nobody will read your book. Nobody will buy your book. Nobody will recommend your book. But your father will tell you, don't go for that meeting. I need you in church. When you come to church, you come and sit down. Maybe the prayer meeting, he has even asked you to come and head. The people won't come early. You came one Sunday, came two Sundays, came three Sundays. Nobody's coming. And then every time you come and sit down. Meanwhile, there's a company of writers that when you go, your destiny will shine. Cry. So now what the problem is, let me go to the high place. Then you go to the high place. Then you go and meet your spiritual uncle there. And he said, hey, what did your father say? So he told me I would be great. Then you try to keep some things and there's ambiguity and then there's a whole lot of mess. So listen to me. To belong to a skilled group or even an anointed group is not the problem. But the wisdom that excels the company of unction is that one in the same place asked a question and said, but who is their father? Nothing in this company can be confirmed unless a fatherly authority places a word by the protocol of the womb. So don't look for breast. Look for placenta. That one is more direct. <laughs> I don't know if I'm confusing you, I'm helping you. But that's it. So that, don't elevate the company of anybody to spiritual authority. I, did, I didn't do that and it helped me. A lot of people see me, and when you see me, you think I'm a, I'm a product of many things and many people and many places. And everybody that knows my history knows me that I've been in one place for all my life. I've listened to one man all my life. Nobody inspires me like him. And I've not been on Facebook for many years now. I, I, I'm not there to read what a lot of people are reading and, and say a whole lot of this one says, this one says, no, 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 no. There are a lot of things, a lot of the times, I, <laughs> I tell you, there are some things that, you know, when I'm musing, I use very intense language. But when it's live like this, there's a lot of lines I cannot give you. But there's a, a lot of things um, that you know that it's not what people say they, they are. The company of prophet does not give you even, uh, you know, one transgenerational element. If it was that, you know, people should have entered their destiny by now, long ago. But it's not so. Stay with the divine authority. Is that not so? Right. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you um, come in and then the next one. Okay, so from First Samuel um, 10, yes. verse 3. Um, we got the highlight of the men going up to God. Yes. And then we also know the other side, the men of God. Right. I want to get the difference. Who are the men going up to God and who are the men of God? Okay. What's the standard for each category? The men who are going up to God have to appeal to a priestly function, which is resting on another. The men who are men of God, they perform the priestly function. So Samuel told Saul, you will meet people and they will give you two loaves. But me, when I meet you, I will come and offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. The other three men who were going up to God, they were holding the goats, but they could not slaughter the goats and offer it because they were not having a priestly function. So the man that has the title as a man of God, he is in the priestly function. Not that he has the tools of the priestly function. No. So Isaac was carrying the lamb. But he did not slaughter the lamb. The one who was not carrying the lamb rather was going to do the slaughtering. I'm talking about Abraham and Isaac. In Genesis 22, is that not it? The Bible said they were going to offer the sacrifice. And it was Isaac that was carrying the lamb. That's what the Bible said. So while they were climbing up, and then... Um, um, no, I mean, it was Isaac that was, was carrying the wood, like that, the wood, sorry, he was carrying the wood. So the Bible says, whilst he was carrying the wood and then they were climbing up, then he asked his father, behold, here is the fire and here is uh, everything that we have, but where is the lamb? And then Abraham told him, God himself shall provide the lamb. When they got onto the hill, then Abraham bound Isaac and then he took the knife. 
Isaac was a man going up to God. Abraham was a man of God. That one comes when in the, in the face of the divine, who performs the priestly function is the man that is the man of God. The one that is holding the things we use to do priestly functions is the man going up to God. When you are holding your tithe, can you spend it? You can't spend it. You are holding the tithe. You are a man going up to God. The man that can take the tithe and bless you and spend it, he is the man of God. I don't know if that is helping you. So, I mean, I'm giving you these analogies because I want you to be able to explain everything practically, sorry, in the light. If God comes here right now and he says that I want to do so, so, and so, and so, then there are people who will be ordained. They'll say, come, you hold the oil. You come, you hold the vesta. Bring the horn. But the one who would now say in the name of the Father and begin to speak as a mouthpiece of the, of the mouth of the Lord and then as the handpiece of the power of God. He is the man of God. So essentially the priest is a man of essence and of function. But the man going up to God is not a man of essence or function. He's a man of one of them at, at any point in time. So I don't know if that is helpful. There's still a lot more to descend with that, but at least this one is, is helpful. There's somebody here, right? Yes. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry. So I have two questions to right. ask. So the first one, you were talking about um, splitting your tithes for churches or maybe your fathers. So what if your motive behind splitting the tithes is not for the purposes of honoring your fathers, but then just in your own way to support the church? Is there okay. something wrong with that? Yes, the tithe is not somebody's own innovation. But here, Hebrews chapter 7, I think verse 8. For here, men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. See? So the tithe is an eternal protocol that rides on the dispensation of a time. The eternal modalities of the Lord do not submit to the intent of a man that is within the regions of time. No, sir. God ordains it that in the, the, the heavenlies, there is an essential tabernacle with the order of the priesthood, with Jesus as the high priest, and Melchizedek, as another dimension of priestly functions in the heavenlies. That's what the Bible is saying. So the Bible says, over here, even men that die receive tithes. But over there, those that receive tithes, they receive them because they are of the order of an endless life. That's what Hebrews is saying. So now you are caught up in a disposition or a modality that has eternal Transtestamental abilities before the law it was there during the law it was there now after the law it is there then after time and into eternity it is there how do you use maybe this is what i think i dis, i want to help someone or two how do you use your personal opinion to obey an eternal principle how do you use it the the the, the fundamental stronghold of titan is honor. If God says, I give you 10, one is for me. Why do you want to give God ideas how to use his one? If you have ideas, why don't you use it on your nine? <laughs> oh, what, is, that, is that nothing? It's as simple as that. You know, the, priest, the priestly you know, order is, is immortalized. Aaron was given gifts and a part of the sacrifices in the temple, the ironic order of priesthood, even the one that the, the Bible says is faulty. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going on before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Even Aaron's priesthood that the Bible says is weak and unprofitable. The Bible says God told him that I have given thee these remunerations in the sanctuary because thou shalt bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. If something goes wrong in the, the arena of grace and I am dissatisfied, you bear it. I have ordained it so. So because you are bearing the shortcomings of the borders of grace, I have ordained that you hold this thing as compensation. So in the realms of the heavens, the mind and the things God has to use that is one tenth for. It is unimaginably higher and more intelligent than your most genuine suggestion. 
Are you understanding me? So, nine is for you, one is for him. If you have any uh, intelligence suggestion, use it on your nine. Let him also use his intelligence suggestion on his one. And let's see whose wisdom is higher. It's as simple as that. <laughs> right, God bless you. Thank you very much. Yes. And the second one is, you may have preached on it before, but then I wasn't here. Okay. So how do you identify your spiritual father? While you were preaching, you made mention of Samuel and the uncle. So that's one way of being able to identify a spiritual father and a spiritual uncle. Yeah. And as you were talking, you also made mention of God revealing it to you. But then right. how else can you know if someone is your spiritual father? Okay. Do, and also, do they always have to be your pastor? Because I think you made mention of the fact okay, that they yeah. don't have to be your pastor. Your pastor is not your spiritual father. Pastoring is not fatherhood. It's not supposed to be so. That's why Paul said, I am writing to you. You see, because around this time that I am writing to you, I'm not the one who is instructing you daily. But don't forget one thing, eh? that I am your father. Fatherhood is not pastoring. Let me lay that foundation well. There are some things that are very tough to say, but we'll have to say it anyway. Amen? Oh, amen. amen. <laughs> it's very tough, but let me say, fatherhood is not pastoring. Pastoring is after the order of instruction and fine-tuning, tutelage, and, and, and then bringing the mind of God for people to become what God has ordained them to be. It's not fatherhood. So now let me ask you one thing. If pastoring is fatherhood, then if you are in a denomination where they transfer pastors, so they bring this pastor, he is the pastor of this assembly for two years. He becomes your spiritual father for two years. Then when they transfer him and they bring another man to come and replace him, then the new one that came also becomes your spiritual father for another two years. Then when they transfer him, and then so if you stay in a place where five pastors come, you will get five fathers in how many years? Fatherhood is not pastoring. Pastoring is a noble calling, an ascension gift. It is noble. But fatherhood is a paradigm. Fatherhood is, is an office of the order of a paradigm. It is a mirror that shows the wisdom of God on how mysteries are supposed to be made. If a man of God preaches to a church, do all his church members become pastors? No. But his sons among them, most likely, they are the ones who will rise to take up the mantle and to follow him. Is that not so? Fatherhood is superior to pastoring. It is superior. The elementary foundations of edification has a place for pastoring. And so by the ascension gift, once you are saved, you will be given to a place where God has ordained one man to become a mouthpiece or an instructor. You are blessed if that man is both your father and your pastor. When he becomes your pastor, the spirit of the Lord leads you to him to talk to you. When he becomes your father, the spirit of God takes the spirit on him and puts on you. It's two different things. The day God came to meet Moses and the 70 elders, he said, and I will come and I will meet thee there with them. And I will take a portion of the honor that is upon you and I will place it on them. But before God came, Moses was pastoring and he was leading these people. The day God came to officiate the transfer of his grace upon a man and put it on them, that was the day he became their father. It was the same for Saul. Samuel heard in his right ear a day before he met him. Fatherhood has no room for probability. It is rigid certainty. You cannot meet your father by mistake. God ordains it. Like I've shown you, that's why the beginning of my delivery was very tedious. I was going line by line. Because someone told Saul, I heard of your coming a day before. I have not met you randomly. I'm not one of those people you can meet as the way you are going to meet people when you are going back. You will not meet me like the way you met the company of prophets. Because they might just be instructors or men to give you a casual brushing. I have intercourse with you in the realms of the spirit, with God as the witness. So I didn't meet you randomly, so listen to me. So you can be pastored by a man, and you follow his teaching, 
you follow his mentoring, you follow his tutelage, then at the pre-designed point in life, God will activate the ordination of the fatherhood protocol of that man on your life. And when you respect that timely divine orchestration, then you have elevated the relationship from pastor and flock to father and son. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's, the whole book of Timothy is a personal letter Paul wrote to Timothy. He didn't write to the church. Was Timothy his only convert? Was Timothy the only one Paul was pastoring? So why did he write a letter to Timothy alone? Because among the congregation, Timothy had been elevated from the point of just a church member. So Saul was no more now just his pastor. He had been elevated. So he said to Timothy, my beloved son. And he wrote it on record. So if you read the book of Timothy, you are reading a, somebody's personal letter. In Titus chapter 1 verse 4. To Titus, my own beloved son. The whole book of Titus was written as a personal letter to his son. Why didn't he address the book of Titus to a church? It's because the whole church were not sons. They were his flock. And he said, well, I have begotten you to a certain degree. There's a dimension that people call fatherhood and he say, okay, he's the father of the assembly. That is a very general and generic term. But when Paul really meant matters of the divine, he would direct it to his personal sons. So I write you this letter, O son Timothy. So you can ele be elevated from the platform of just a church member pastor relationship to now a father son. And that occurrence, God officiates it. I said, Who officiates it? It's not when you go and put a seed at the feet of the man. Money does not make anybody a son. I don't know if that offends you or whatever. In the kingdom, the highest legal tender is not mammon, it's the soul. Eh? That is why when Isaac wanted to bless Esau, he said, go and bring me savory meat and make me venison as I love, that my soul may be merry and then I will bless you. If you are able to satiate my soul because I want to give you the highest blessing in the kingdom. In the kingdom, the highest legal tender is not mammon. The highest legal tender is the soul. So when you get to a dimension of appreciation and God sees that you are ready for it, then he will execute this spiritual ordinance and come down and he will take the spirit that rests upon the superior and he will put it on the one that is inferior. I don't know if I've helped you a lot. I'm very passionate about these things, so pardon me when I'm, uh, you know, it looks like I'm, I'm very intense about it because I'm very passionate. So your pastor is not your father. And then, no, I, the, the, oh, let me give you a paradigm in Hebrews 5. And um, everybody, you can use this. Those of you who know your fathers already, you might not need it. So if you want God to show you your spiritual father, Take Isaiah 61 and Luke chapter 4. This is the manifesto of Jesus. The divine purpose, word for word. That's Isaiah 61, the prophetic element of his coming. And in Luke chapter 4, you see? So I'm giving you a, what to do to know your spiritual father. Spiritual fatherhood is ordained for purpose. Purpose alone. God doesn't give any man a father until there's a... There's an ordained assignment. So when you have a father, what you need from him is the ordained assignment, primarily. So Hebrews chapter 5 from verse 1, if you're reading your Bible, it says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. Number two, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Then the three, and by reason hereof, he ought as for the people, so for himself to offer for sins. And then verse 4. And no man taketh this honor upon himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So now I'm giving you the paradigm to get God give you a high priest or a father over your life. Number one, go to God and say, who among men 
is ordained for me in things pertaining to you. That's the first prayer you pray. And it's word for word scripture. So it will not fail. I'm not telling you my mind. If you want to know your spiritual father, go to God and say, Father, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1. Every high priest is taken from among men and is ordained for men. So who among men in things pertaining to my godly destiny is ordained for me? If you don't pray this prayer, you will meet uncles. Because you will go to programs with inquisitive, inquisitiveness and then curiosity. You say, hey, the way this man preaches, apostle is my father. Hey! No, 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 no. If I'm not supposed to be your father, the best I can do is to help you to respect your father more. It's okay if I'm not your father. I don't have to be everybody's father. Oratory, okay, you know. The tongue of the learned is superior to the excellency of speech. There are two different highways. People are carried away by expressions. No, no, don't, don't do that. So you need to go to God and say, God, I want to know my father, number one. Who among men is ordained for me in things pertaining to you? That's the first one. Then you go to the next level. Who can have compassion on my ignorance and who can tolerate my deviation? Send him to me. Because the father is supposed to have a large tolerance for your inevitable stupidity. Hey. Okay, I'm sorry. You know, I, like I told you, I'm very intense about this. <laughs> I'm very intense about, about these things, so don't, don't worry. Um, when I'm thinking alone, I think like this, so now I'm caught on words. It's a, it's a surprise. It's a, <laughs> it's a surprise, you know. The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Foolishness is not externally attacked on the surface of the heart of a child. It is bound. And binding is a strong vocabulary. That means it's like konongokaya. You are even scrubbing it, it's not going. Every man born of the womb is entitled to a natural level of stupidity. And so you must ask God, who can have compassion on my ignorance and my being out of the way? Some of you, you are sickly proud. Some of us, we are sickly self-sufficient. When I started responding to the you know, fatherly dictates of my, my dad, me, I am by the grace of God, I am multi-talented. I do music, I do oratory, I can act, I can, I can preach, I can do a whole lot of things. So at the point in time, I would say I'm teaching people how to play, you know, instrument, church, music school. Then I'll be teaching them. Now give them a simple instruction, they won't do it. And me, you don't tell me you didn't do it. No, sir. So I come by, I say, did you do it? They say, I didn't do it. I say, okay, music school disbanded. Everybody, get up, go home. Then when they are going home, then they will call my father. Dad. Joe, I go to school, no? <laughs> my father would take the phone. Joe, oh, hey, damn, oh, sorry. Now, school, no? And then, now, uh, AC, what? That means, uh, you break it, you can't, you record back, you record back. And what that means is that uh, we put it on the break a little, and then uh, we are going back, we are going back. Because I know once he has called me, but I was very self-sufficient. I give you something to do, you don't do it, I suck you, I do it myself. And the painful thing is that I'll do it better than the way you were coming to do it. So I ended up causing a lot of people a lot of pain. Then when I began to preach, I would say things in a certain way. And he could see my militant disposition in my utterances. And I would tell them, my, my calling is apostolic. So don't expect pastoral tendencies from me. And he called me to the office. And I sit like this because when my father wants to talk seriously, this is how he sits. <laughs> Joe. When you say you don't have, what do you mean? <laughs> and then I'll say, oh, that. And I think it's that way we're funny, serious. Is saying. <laughs> you know, but when I was saying it, I was very careless. Then you tell me, no, go back. Go back. Go and start the music school again. I'm boiling. So go and start for these people. They're not serious. They won't. And then I'll go back. I will go back. Later on in life, then I come to read Hebrews chapter 5. Ah, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Yeah? So if God had not given me a father who would tell me, it's not about your militant, you know, um, exclusivity. The fact that you are five-talent holder does not mean everybody is a five-talent holder. So I had to inflate the tolerance of my inner man. And so now people can talk trash in my faith and I'll say, God bless you, sir. <laughs> Earlier on, 
<laughs> Ababi Dinam. <laughs> Earlier on, Ababi Dinam. So I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm helping you. So the next thing is, God, who is the man that can have compassion on my deviation and on, on, and on my, uh, you know, my, my being out of the way? And then the three is, who can offer, um, um, you know, pacification for sins and give gifts on my behalf? You know, there are men, when you get a spiritual father, eh? In the 21st century, we know about sons giving father seeds. When you meet a spiritual father, huh, the one who spends more is the father on the son, not the son on the father. Forget this um, simplistic confusion of the 21st century church, where it is sons who are now bringing money to come and make fathers rich and all these this casual you know, ex- expositions. No. The high priest must offer for the people as for himself gifts and sacrifices. I honor God with my substance on behalf of my sons because that is the credibility of the priestly function. And I pacify judgment from the arena of grace on behalf of my sons by sacrifices before they even have to mature to give me anything. No, sir. For a long while in my life, for many years, there's no son that gave me any seed that I spent one CD from it. Never. Because you see, when you don't know, you'll be judged later. But some of us, we have revelatory death. The degree to which I command insight to some of these things, I, I will be held accountable for certain things. You need to ask for a man who can give an offering to stay the plague on your behalf. Not the one that even when you are suffering, he says you should bring a seed before the suffering will end. Uh, you know these things I'm very passionate about it man what are you talking about you know you I need I I I I see the battle of my sons and I clear my account no oh apostle you know you know I'm I'm I'm, I I had this dream and whatever and you know no 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 I'm like I'll get back to you it's because I know what to do to offer gifts and sacrifices the gift is for honor. Sacrifices is for atonement, pacification. Because I understand what it is like to have a dream that is above you. So I fight the battle silently with gifts and sacrifices. Not that in your, in your thing, I say, you, you get a dream and you were shot. And I say, hey, this one, if you don't bring $1,000, you will die. Oh. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that sowing seed to avert danger is wrong. But this is the foundational thing. The high priest is the one supposed to offer. Did Jesus kill somebody before he killed himself? What? So what, what are we saying? The supreme ethic of the kingdom is not prosperity, it's self-denial. Yeah. Instructors stop on the prosperity level. The fathers take up the baton from prosperity on the level of self-denial. So in the last two verses of Hebrews chapter 11, which is the hall of faith, and these all, having obtained a good report, through faith, obtain not the promises. God having designed a better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. They sacrificed faith to receive something and told God it should be given to us. So, at the peak of fatherhood, which is in tandem with the supreme ethic of the kingdom, which is love and not prosperity, is sacrifice. So you need to ask God, who can sacrifice for me? Not a man that even when I don't have, he says I should close my account. And until I close my account, nothing will change. I'm not saying closing your account does not change things. But this paradigm of exploitation will not take us anywhere. You see fathers who are overflowing with excess, and you see sons that are in depravity that sends them into error. And then they will come and preach that, oh, it's because they are greedy. They are chasing money. No, sir. No. You don't torture a man above his tolerance limit and say he failed the test. Because that is a trap, it's not a test. As a father, you are entitled to testing the sons, not trapping them. A trap is ordained to be above the tolerance level of the person. A test is ordained to be equal to the tolerance level of the person. If you make a man's life stringent as a father, to the point that he stumbles because of deficiency, and he falls, Jesus says it were better for you that a millstone were hung around your neck, and you dropped in the sea to to, to kill you. How can you make a young man suffer until he walks into error and say he fell into error because he is greedy? You are not God. You might not know the line from where the thing you are designed for him as a test turns into a trap. The guy is crumbling on the inside. Hope deferred, make the man sick. 
And so that's why Proverbs says, if it is in thy power to do it good, defer not it and tell the man, go and come. True godliness is this, to visit widows and the fatherless in their affliction and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. That is the epistle of James to the church. So that's it. Who can sacrifice for me? It's not who enjoys my money. No. No, if you bring me seed and God says, I should take, I will take. There's nothing wrong with seeding. Venison is verily the season changer. Venison is verily the season changer. <laughs> if you bring venison, your season will change. But if I starve you and trap you and call it a test, no, sir. The Bible says every test that God ordains, he makes sure that it has not the power to overtake him, such as unless it is common among men. And even with that, he will make a way of escape. You don't torture people and say it is the training of sonship. No, sir. You can't do that. And sons too, you don't look for fathers who will pamper you. Okay, so then the last one is, um, and no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God. Who is the man that I will meet that will not command reverence after the order of idolatry? There are men that if you want to celebrate them as fathers, you need to kiss their foot. What? What? <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's a blessing to be live, or, or what do you think? The, I tell you, it's a blessing to be live. You know, Reverence is not idolatry. Two different things. But reverence is good. I'm not saying reverence is shabby. But look for a man who doesn't take honor upon himself. He forces that he is the one that is your superior. He is the one that, no sir. No sir. I told you, the proof that Jesus gave birth to the apostles is that he could preach a message and ask them, will he also go? That's it. He's not possessive. It is the possessiveness of purported fathers. That is the stronghold of the spirit of Jezebel. Because manipulation is witchcraft. Yeah. I'm saying a lot of things. I don't know whether it's adding up. So, uh, next question, please. <laughs> oh, well, I thought people, you have asked your question already. Yeah, some people have sent in questions oh, right. from online. Yeah. Right. So, um, one is saying, does it matter who the gifts come from? That's the gifts David received from his father. Mm -hmm. And if yes, how do you deal with a situation where a father dies before giving the gifts? And then there's one saying that what do the gifts symbolize? Hey, <laughs> you let me digress. Oh. Kids, loaves of bread and wine. Atonement, honor, well, atonement is pacification like the kid. The kid well, is for your stubbornness. The sacrifice goes as a burnt offering for error. So the kid is for your stubbornness. Peace offerings are for your frail obedience celebrations. I'm not perfect, but in my weakness, I've been able to do something good. And God says, because I'm perfect, when you take a godly step, then I meet you halfway and then I empower you. So there is glory on earth in vessels. That is the loaf. The wine is when there is confirmation that the, 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 the two have been successful and it is the cutting of the New Testament to bring the benefits of what God ordained. I don't know if that is... If I will go into this thing, eh? You go further in First Samuel chapter 14, 15, there about it. Eh? Then you see the error why um, um, Saul, when he did not get the wine, when you do not get the wine, it means the covenant has not been established. So you cannot have the blessedness of the new covenant. Let me show you one mistake that Saul made in 1 Samuel. Let's go to 14, I guess. I don't know if I'm being too tedious, but pardon me. I will look for it and then I'll let you have it. So... Um, yeah, you are you seeing something? No, I. Oh God, help me! No, I'll hold on. I'll find this thing for you. Okay, First Samuel, I think thirteen. Let's go to.
Um, Saul made an oath. Uh huh. Okay. So you know, Saul. Uh, there was a time when Jonathan left the camp, and Saul did not know he had left the camp in First Samuel 14. Eh? Saul did not know that Jonathan had left the camp, and he tried. Um, asking God by, you know, doing some priestly things, and God did not respond. You remember? And then Saul made an oath, and he said, nobody should eat anything today. He declared a fast that anybody who eats in the camp, the person is cursed. Uh, do, you, do you remember that? Okay. So now, he put an embargo on anybody eating. So in First Samuel 14, 24, what is there? And the men of Israel were distressed that day. For Saul had adjured the people saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may be avenged on my enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. This is what Saul said. He said, anybody who eats until evening is cursed. But Jonathan was not there when he gave that that condition. So Jonathan went to um, um, have victory over uh, the enemy and then let's see what Jonathan did verse 27 but first Samuel 14 27 but Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath wherefore he put forth the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in an honeycomb and put his hand into his mouth and his eyes were enlightened Jonathan did not know that his father had placed the curse on anybody who eats. Then he went to win a battle and he saw Oni. And he said, this Oni dear, who no like good thing? So like Samson, the Bible says he was holding a rod, he dipped it in the thing and then he put it in his mouth. Then answered one of the people and said, Thy father straightly charged the people with an oath saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Verse 29. Then Jonathan said, My father had troubled the land. See, I pray you, how my eyes have been enlightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much more if happily the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found. For had there not been now a much greater slaughter among the Philistines. Because Saul did not receive the wine, he didn't have the establishment of a covenant that allows him and the people to enjoy it. So any time there was going to be a breakthrough of prosperity, then he would give a foolish oath that anybody who eats should die. And Jonathan said, my father has troubled the land. The day he placed the curse is the day we got the best goods. When you don't have the wine, this is how your ministry is. The wine is the cutting of the testament for establishment so you can be entitled to the benefit. On the day that the best honey was supposed to be the food of the whole nation, the Bible said they were distressed and they are not eating and they came on the honey. And they say, our, our father gave an oath. Why did he give the oath the day when the money will come? When your father does not have the bottle of wine, he will make a foolish vow in the day it's going to rain prosperity. And you will be denied. I've seen people hold sons they should have released and they would have built an empire if they released the sons. But they held them until they and their sons died poor. I don't know whether... So, so the wine is for the cutting of the covenant for establishment so you can be entitled to the benefit. And then the peace offerings is... In my frailty, I have been able to obey God even with my imperfection. So that's the celebration. But the kids is the atonement for your stubbornness and your error. Pacification for when you go out of the way or when you break the law. And David had all. You remember? So when he sinned and he called on God, the only thing he had to do was to own up. So you to own up, it will help you. (laughs) Praise the Lord. Right, somebody's question. Apostle, yes, sir. Uh, the picture with the high place is still not 
that clear with me. Okay. Um, is it a taboo for somebody like a son to go to the high place? Because I'm looking at Saul, and uh, from the very start of his journey, yeah. he had a foretaste of the high place with the father. Yeah. Then the father says, okay, if you go on and go on, even at that time when he had a foretaste at the high place, he wasn't in court. He, he did not have God with him in court. Yeah. So now that he has God with him, and the father has also given him that if um, um, do as occasion serve thee. Yes, for God is with thee. For God is with thee. Yeah. Him going to the high table, um, I just... I the high place. Yeah, yes. that's a very good question. I like it when people are genuine and they bring out the, uh, you know, the real concern. Because like I always tell, tell you, fatherhood is not idolatry. Reverence is not idol worship. It's two different things. Now, he said, do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And, and let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, only because God is the reverence. The protocol of exclusive entry by the frequency of once in a year was broken the day Jesus died. So the holies of holies was out of bounds yesterday. It is not out of bounds today. What has changed? Because of what God did, not because of what men did. So there is a place you will go yesterday. It was not wrong. You go to that same place today. It is wrong. Because what permits the entry into the place is what the heavens are doing in the moment. So all what I'm trying to tell you is, there are places you go sometimes because of injurious curiosity. If you go to those places, even if it is one hour you went to spend there, you have thrown your life away by a deviation that is very serious. Nevertheless, those same places, you can go to that place with prescribed, you know, efficiency from God. The reference is, do as occasion serve thee. Use your discretion, not because we trust in your discretion, but because God is with you. So it's the God with you that is always indicating whether you can go there or not. Is that, is that fine? So you are free to explore elements, you know, in the arena of grace. But always ask yourself, is the permissible the perfect? No. The permissible is not the perfect. The, because there is permission and I can also go, go and stand there and say some, does not mean God perfectly will that I should go and say some. Many believers stop at the permissible. They want to know what we are allowed to do. And that is the proof of immaturity. The precursor to stunted growth is permissibleness. When everything is permitted, you don't grow. Yeah. The antidote to more nutrition is not hypernutrition. Because if you overeat, it's called gluttony. It's a sin. If you are permitted to do anything at any point in time, the Bible says you are unskilled in the word of righteousness for you are a babe because you can't discern evil from good. But when you now become a man who is of full age, to whom belongs strong meat, then Hebrews says you are by the exercising of your, 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 your gift, you've been able to discern between good and evil. There's a place you go tomorrow that is not an error. If you go back to that same place two weeks after tomorrow, you are going to incur an injury. Do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. You know, I, I like to honor people a lot. I would rather come to submit and honor than to come as an equal. In my bid to be genuinely hearted, eh? genuine hearted, I realized that there were times that curiosity moved me and I thought it was the Spirit of God. I concluded it was God's spirit. Later in life, I realized that, oh my God, there was a margin of, of injurious curiosity. When God ended here, I should have known it was, that was how far he wanted me to go. But like you're saying, I felt, well, the high place, sometimes we are sent there. Sometimes we do some of these things. Why not, not today? Then later you realize that it's not that what you did was wrong, but the timing. So he said, do as occasion serve thee, but it's only because God is with thee. Your consciousness of the fact that there is a sovereign being who can tell you the thing is good but the time is wrong. So that's it. God bless you. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you, Apostle, God for bless you. this timely information. 
Please, um, you earlier uh, explained yeah. the role of the father. Right. And I, I want to ask uh, pertaining training. Right. What are some of the forms the training is supposed to take? Yeah. Is, it, is it going to be, is, or supposed to be systematic, where you, the son, also have to follow in that order? Yeah. And where, uh, that will be a follow-up, where those uh, trainings are lacking, uh, would it be enough reason to uh, point out to you that that person might your, not be your father. your father? That's a very good and a very genuine question. I like practical questions, just like all the other ones, because you need to know how to take a step. Now, um, in, <laughs> in the kingdom... Paul defines something very clear that the excellency of speech is not the tongue of the learned. Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4. For God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to them that are bruised or to them that are oppressed. He wakened my ear morning by morning. He wakened my ear to hear as the learned. So normally we would want to meet people who are very systematic in their training. But you see, systematic expression is a dimension people have to get to. Your father might be genuine and he's ordained as your father, but he might not have systematic expression. He might not have it. In the school of life, we use a humble heart to learn. In the school of philosophy, we use a prideful intelligence to learn. If you enter philosophical training, they can write one sentence that fills one page without punctuation mark. Because the pride of the study of philosophy is the letter. But in the kingdom, the pride is not in the letter. So we don't see clarity from the letter, but clarity from the credible essence. So Jesus said, the born again experience, Nicodemus, you want me to give you a stepwise thing? It's like the wind. All you need is to be broken. When you are broken, it will start. If you look at my father and I, a lot of things he has communicated to me, he didn't do it in utterance. When I was young and I was learning from him, I realized that God was using his actions and sometimes his passive, silent demeanor to talk louder than words. So you get to a point, don't go with an unreasonable interface of judgment the man must be able to talk systematically uh, i know the fatherhood is for training say what is the syllabus with which you are training me and that no no when you do that you can never catch a mantle elijah asked Elijah, the lord has sent me to bethel stay here and that careless shrouding means if you are wise follow me how is the, how was elijah supposed to follow him by saying stay here because it's only me that god has sent he went to the next place. They got to Bethel. He said, the Lord has sent me to Jordan. You stay here. How was Elijah supposed to get that? Is this a systematic approach of training? It's not systematic. The first time Elijah saw Elijah, he threw his mantle on him. He didn't even ask him anything. He walked on. Can you imagine following somebody like this? The first time Elijah met Elijah, he was plowing with oxen. He was on the 12th oxen. Then Elijah, Elijah saw him. Then he threw his mantle on him. And he started walking away. Ah, if it was you and I today, we would chase him and say, Maza, Maza. The fact that you are a prophet does not mean, quick, 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 we will exchange. No, but then look for the heart first. Because in the kingdom, when you have a heart, you see structure in disorder. I don't know if you understand me. In the kingdom, the highest form of beauty is in torture by design. That's why Jesus' face was disfigured on the cross until the nobles looked on him and they realized that that's what the Bible says. They looked at him and they said, now this man does not look human. The whole visage was mad beyond recognition as a human. But for his mandate, the Bible said to appoint for them beauty for ashes. How did he bring beauty? By torture that disfigures the face, and yet the beauty was in it. So the kingdom is that there is wisdom in disorder. So if you want to learn from any father, 
and you go with the finest expectations of secular wisdom, everybody will fall short of your status of a father. Go with a heart, a broken heart. When you are broken, even when your father insults you in frustration, you will get a sermon from it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean it. Even when he throws his hand into the air and vexes his sore displeasure on you and speaks something as if he's, he's frustrated, he's tired of you and he walks away. The highest form of beauty in the kingdom is torture by design. In the midst of the bruising is beauty for ashes. So don't go explaining whatever. Nevertheless, when your father begins the real spiritual work, the first thing he does is make sure he has introduced you to the foundations of the doctrines of Christ. I see people who say they've met fathers and them um, all they talk about the content of what they are doing. And there are even people who are fathers who are moving with you know, their sons and they don't know that they would be judged according to a, a syllabus in scripture. There are fundamental doctrines in the kingdom. And it is your duty that any soul that God sends to you, the first thing you have the moral right to communicate to these people are the fundamental doctrines. Not how to do a program. Excuse me, sir. It's not. So we are talking eternal realities. A man that sits you down and asks you in your face, even after preaching for five years, do you know Christ? This is your father. Yeah. <laughs> or you don't know. At the table of the communion, the covenant table, Jesus sat with Peter and he looked into his eyes after walking with him for three and a half years. Simon, Simon, lovest thou me? And Simon said, Ah, now Jesus, a question being. Obi, I'm a preacher three years. If you know, maybe Sam said, You're born again. But he was asking him, That means he's your father. The man that tells you that even at the peak of your trusting yourself, his only responsibility is to ask you, do you have genuine intercourse with the divine? Simon, Simon, lovest thou me? He asked him the third time and Peter was offended. Because in the eyes of the natural, we have passed that level. Your real father is the one who knows that there are basic doctrines of the faith which stand as still the ultimate level of fulfillment. He points you to Christ. The next thing is he points you that you will be made in the image of the Christ. Character, not gift. What did I say? Character, not gift. In the play of life, character is rather the knack actor. If you want the main actor in the play series of life, the main character is called character. Yeah. Yeah. What are you doing with an accurate, loose talker prophet? A man that talks the mind of God accurately and when he descends from the pulpit, he can say anything to anybody in the next instant. Even God, when Moses used stammering as, as, a, as an excuse, said, okay, then I will, I will look for a man to speak for you. Because loose talking, the Anyam is tired. So he said, somebody will have to come and speak for you. Character, character, character. Can you sit by one million dollars for 10 years and say it is not mine, so I won't take a dime from it? Can you? Can you? You say, hey, Apostle, you go hard, oh. <laughs> Apostle, you go hard, oh. Can you sit in an office? There are a lot of times in your young life, there's a place you get to and you think there are things you can do easily. When they rush you to some place and they say, oh, the system is like this, but there's this thing you can pay so they can attend to you fast. Before you say father, you are paid. <laughs> there are men who can subject your life to rigorous integrity test. Character. A man who is concerned about character. Who will tell you, tell me plain language. In the last 30 days, have you been able to read the Bible every day? A man who will ask you these questions. I say, tell, tell me. The memory verse you are quoting, do you believe it in your heart? Do you? Let me tell you something that's very emotional for me, but I'll tell you anyway. A few years ago, I lost a friend. He was a very close and a very dear friend. We were doing ministry together. And then he was one year older than me. And then he used to respect me so much, and I used to respect him so much. 
And at a point in time, he was sick. And apparently, the, the, ailment, the ailment was, it was, it was, it was debilitating. That means it was eating him, eating him up. It was very dangerous. The disease was slowly killing him. But he didn't tell anybody. And he didn't even tell me. So I was there one day. And my phone rang. And when I picked up, it was, it was him. So he said, bro. I'm like, hey. Charlie, what's up, what's up, what's up? So we uh, said, oh, it's fine. We talked, everything. How are you? I'm like, Charlie, I'm sorry. I've not checked on you. He said, oh, yeah, I know. I saw um, your, your um, uh, what do you call it, program, whatever. And I knew you had given uh, that you would be on waiting. So I didn't want to worry you. I said, okay, but I'm back. I'm back now. So whatever. I did, and then we talked, we talked. Then he asked me a question I will never forget. He said, bro, he used to call me like that. He said, bro. I said, yeah. He said, the power in the book of Acts, is it literal? That means that the, 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 the power demonstration that is recorded in the book of Acts, that they laid hands and sick people recovered and people's shadow fell on people and, like, and they got up. So he asked me, bro, the power in the book of Acts, is it literal? And I was shocked he was asking me that question. Because we pray together. When I'm going on waiting, eh, and I do a manual and I finish, he's one of the few people I send it to. So he'll tell me, even if you won't go on the waiting with me, he will always tell me to leave my manual in his mail before I will go on waiting. So I will send him things. He preaches, I preach, we exchange, we pop it, we do a lot of things. And then he calls me and he says, the power in the book of Acts, is it literal? Is it raw? And I was shaking. I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's raw. Then he asked me, so the Holy Ghost power, it is literal. I'm like, ah, why is this boy asking me these things? I said, yeah, it's literal. Then he said, bro, then the church of God, we need a lot of power. At that point, he was asking me this question. I didn't know he was dying. He never told me. But I'll never forget that conversation. So he said, and then I said, yeah, it's literal. Then he said, bro, then the power of the Holy Ghost, we need a lot of it in the church. You see, you can observe a practice and embrace the practice to become a routine. And then the routine becomes a routine part of you. And you are caught up in, we speak in tongues. When somebody is sick, we lay hands. But your spiritual father is the one who calls you and makes sure what you are professing works for you. Huh? I said, what you are professing, it does what? Yeah. It works for you. When you called on Jesus, did he respond? And you say, yeah, he responds. Say, what is the evidence he responds? Then you have nothing to prove. Then you look into your eyes and say, son, you have not met him yet. Go look for him. Go look for him. Somebody came to me and asked me, Apostle, so can I interpret dreams like the way you interpret dreams? I said, son, if, it, if dream interpretation, that spirit, when it comes, you will know impartation is real. That's one of my favorite quotes. The height from which a mantle falls is the new height of the man on whom it falls. Dwarfs can become giants by impartation. Yeah. If you don't have it, don't go seducing people that you have it. Now, the gospel in the kingdom is seductive. You see somebody recording a miracle. Can you see? Uh, yes, I can see. I can see. Somebody who's been blind for five years, when he begins to see, this is not the way he will express it. Pardon? Yeah. You see, we are trying to bring a seductive interface. When you give tithes, does it work? <laughs> Everything in the kingdom works. <laughs> does it work for you? <laughs> it will work. No, son. Has it worked? Yes, it has worked. Where is the proof it has worked? God is good. God is good. Your father is the one that makes you place a demand on the divine for evidence. God is no more in sanctified obscurity. He stepped out of sanctified obscurity by his own will. Power must be tested. 
That's why he says even his word, he passed it seven times through fire. What kind of Holy Ghost is the one that moves and we don't know whether he has come or is yet coming? What kind of Holy Ghost is this? No, sir, I want the one that when he passes, even the blind man knows that power is passing and he says, if I don't shout today, I won't shout anymore. Yeshua ben David, have mercy on me because he acknowledges that an undisputable power has arrived. And every time, check your Bible. When Jesus prayed for the blind, the next thing he asked them, do you see? Do you see? And they said, yes, I see. No, I see men as trees. I don't stop at you seeing men like trees. He laid his hands again. Ephata, do you see? They said, now I see men correctly. You may go. Your spiritual father will test you by giving you an appetite that you shot nothing short of the evidence of the power of God. The gospel is not a seduction. The word of God has been tested by fire. So men are entitled to prove it. Not that every time we tell them, believe and it is done. And where is the evidence? So you don't ask too many questions. That's because of doubt. What are you trying to say? The man prayed to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And he made the miracle happen. When Abraham met God and Sarah met God in the house, after they had given the, the three people food to eat, Abraham laughed and Sarah laughed, but God still spoke. But today we preach in the kingdom. Even if something small passes into your mind as a question, you know, hey, you don't have faith, so you will die. You don't have faith, so you will die. You think the gospel is not prepared to be tested? The word of God is a living entity, not a system of codified expressions. No, the word is a living organism. He can defend himself. And that's what he uses to insult the other gods. He said, they, they have ears, they don't hear. Me, I have ear, I hear. That's the difference. So your spiritual father will send you back to the closet. Prove the things and hold thou fast unto what is good. The thing that is seductive. They say, I felt the spirit. I felt, you, you felt what spirit? I felt the spirit. I felt the spirit. You have gone to Coco in the closet and you have done things to yourself. You come and you say, you felt the spirit. What is the evidence that you, you felt the spirit? They say, oh, the way I was shaking. Rubbish. Hey. I'm, uh, no, 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 no. Not rubbish. The way I was shaking. Since when did shaking mean that God has arrived? Since when did the Bible say we should use quakings to indicate the coming of the, of, of the power of God? Since when did we have to use shakings in, 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 into... Don't let me go into some things. If you go into when the doctrines of devils begins, eh? and you, you maybe another time, then you will get to realize that, hey, the church is in crisis. The church is in crisis. Why do we use charismatic frenzies that can be exploited by, exploited by evil spirit. Why do we use this as an interface of revival? Who certified that this frenzy should be the interface of revival? Who certified it? And so now when the devil comes, some people and does some shabby devilish things with some Jesus interface, they say, oh, that one too is revival. It's called the doctrines of devils. And we don't have to get there. So your father will always send you back to the closet. I always tell my son, there's no money you are going to sh sh come and show me and I will forget to ask you certain questions. No, I will never forget. Because what I owe you is the grace to become after the image of, of God. So eternal realities, he will show you scripture, he will show you the true foundations of salvation and then he will always ask you the evidence of your intercourse with the divine. Any claim you make, you will prove it. And then the last one is correction. God bless you. Hey, you long ago. So we are rounding up. Okay. Yes. Yes. Hello, Apostle. So this is a question from Facebook. The lady is called Nade Dizi. Okay. Her question is, who must receive your tithe? Is it your pastor or your spiritual father? And if you attend multiple churches by virtue of residing in different jurisdictions, where must you pay your tithe? Who? Yes. So if you reside in um, different jurisdictions, every area you go to, do you have to pay a tithe in that place? And the, seen, okay. The second question is... Hey, another one. Yes, please. Right. So in a situation where the son is revealed to the father, but the son does not even know the father is a spiritual father, and maybe the son is submitted to somebody else, what must the father do? The father must intercede for the son for God to release him. Because there's no transaction that is done over the soul of a man without the intent of divinity. You don't walk into another man's house to take your son from him. You ask God to relocate him. 
The transactions over the soul of a man is never done without the intent of the divine. You don't walk into another man's shed to pick out a soul from his, his, his place. We only do that to the elements of strong men in the dark domain. You don't discomfit a member of the kingdom to take what is under him. It's not permitted. That's why in the Bible, in the kingdom, we don't exercise rulership in the kingdom. Rulership is exercised outside the kingdom. So authority outside the kingdom is for rulership. And when you rule, you can discomfit. In the kingdom, we don't bear rule over people. We bear a bishopric mantle. That means we lead them. We don't lord things over them. So in the kingdom, you don't discomfit a saint. You don't go under him and pull somebody from him. You don't sugarcoat words and entice people to leave another man's domain. God will judge you. You don't go as a visiting pastor and say, oh, I have a revelation, whatsoever. The only proof that what God revealed to you, he revealed it, is that there is nothing you can do of your own accord to bring that soul to you unless God releases him. So never say, yeah, you, God really, really revealed to me that yeah, you, you are my son. Oh, where you are is not where you belong. Then you start telling them. The, re- the way you are telling them is proof that the revelation you had is wrong. If the revelation you had is real, you go back to God. You know very well in the kingdom we don't discomfit another saint. I cannot go and go and defeat him and take what belongs to him. I can't even go and announce to him because I'm indirectly fighting the man by asking people to leave him. You can ask everybody who has worked with me, either as an instructor or as a father. If I am not your father, I will always send you back. I will always tell you, listen, I know you admire me. I know you want to command the death that I carry. I know you want to, you know, experience many things. I will show you how to do them, but stay with your father. Because if I entice you to leave your father, I have discomfited your father. And in the kingdom, discomfiture is only for enemies. We don't defeat brothers in the kingdom. We defeat enemies. So even if I ask people to subtly leave your camp and come to me, purporting that my action is consequent to a divine revelation, is judgment, my judgment is in my own mouth. Let everybody stay with where God has put them. Is that not fair? If God has relieved, re- revealed to you that the person submitting somewhere is your son, you go back, you tell God, Father, you know this thing you have shown me, I cannot do anything about it. All I can do is I am ready if you release that person to come. So express readiness for the divine responsibility and ask God to execute it. Don't find smart ways of making people leave anybody to come under your shed. If you do that, you have discomfited a brother in the kingdom and then you have engaged the protocol of vengeance. What is divine will fight you. Don't do that. What was the next question? Tight. Who do you give your tight to? Tithing is... <laughs> An eternal modality and it is transgenerational and it is transtestamental. So in Hebrews chapter 7, the Bible says, And they that are the sons of Levi, and even Levi who received the priesthood, paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek, the Bible says, even the children in his loins, like Levi, who were not yet born, they also paid tithe. So tithe is transgenerational. Are you understanding me? Now the second thing is that it is transtestamental. That means it crosses both the Old Testament and the New Testament and the dispensations before and after them. The first time we hear of tithes in the Bible is when Abraham met Melchizedek. And the Bible says this Melchizedek, priest of the Most High God, King of Salem, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, to whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first be by interpretation King of Righteousness, and after that also King of Salem, which is King of Peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abided a priest continually. This is... <laughs> why is the... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> the first predisposition of the man that received tithe. So the eternal interface of a tithe receiver is that you, I'm saying something that is not usual. That's why I quoted scripture verbatim. And I'm bringing you back. So what I say is not because of what I do. Tithing is only found in the church. 
after the ironic priesthood. Yes or no? In the, in the realms of the, the spirit, there is the ironic priesthood, there is the order of Melchizedek. So the Bible says, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for, by, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that there should arise another priest after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. What does that mean? What that means is that the ironic priesthood is imperfect. So if you are practicing it, epim, what did I say? <laughs> epim means, like in English, what I'm trying to say, it pimps. It pimps. That means that you will have an interface where a lot of things are undefined and it will look as if it is erroneous. So people that operate the tithing with the ironic methodology, they have issues. And those are the people that have it rigid with, it must be a church, you must pay it to your pastor. The tabernacle kind of rigidity is only seen with the ironic form of tithing. That one fails and is dispensational. The one that Melchizedek came to operate, he didn't receive the tithe from Abraham because Abraham was in his church. He met him. He had not even met him before. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So it was not tight Sunday. <laughs> That's the first thing. The second thing was that he didn't have any mortal tentacles of deciding what Melchizedek would do with the tithe. He gave it to a personality, not an institution. The eternal modalities of titan is given to a person, not an institution. God does not anoint systems. He anoints people. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, now, I'm not trying to make you very controversial to go attacking all sorts of things. I'm giving you the options. Wherever you feel, you can start from. The heavens in the wisdom of God have room for you to mature to a level of revelation that works for you. There are people who are learning tithing, but technically they are using the Aaronic and the Levitical priesthood. That one, the sons of Levi, it's rigid, it's defined. And that's why they will tell you, okay, then if it is tithing, then somebody will raise the argument. It had to be food, you had to do this, then you had to eat it in the presence and do all those things. But we don't operate only the ironic. We switch from the ironic to the Melchizedek, which is of the order of Christ. So when people start from there, they will grow into the revelation. But tithing in itself, as it appeared before the law, Abraham gave the tithe to a priest. He, gave it to, he paid tithe to a personality, not a church. Here, men that die receive a tithe, but there he received them of whom it is witness that he liveth. Over there, it is the one that has the power of an endless life who receives the tithe. So God sends men as representatives of his honor, living bodily representatives of his honor. Then they come and receive the tithe. So a lot of people who pay tithe with the proud mindset that I didn't give it to man of God to be chopping on. I gave it to the institution. So let the institution use it wisely. Your money perish with you. Yeah. Yeah. Then go and build, um, uh, what do you call it, orphanages on your own and become a priest on yourself. The humility of the tithe is in the fact that God ordains men by his own language from among men as occupying a, a privileged pedestal. That is uncommon. So... If God sends your pastor and you pay tithe to the church, you are paying tithe to the man because God has extended him in the institution. Not that it's not him I'm giving it to. So he's not to be going around and be chopping. Of course, yes. Nobody is supposed to take things that are brought to honor God and use it anyhow. But the people bringing it must have the humble mindset that tithing is to the priest, not the system of priesthood. God doesn't anoint systems. He anoints personalities. I pay tithe 
with the intent that my father will make use of my, my, um, my substance on behalf of God. Not that the complex system will now say this is what we do and we take a pass through here. All those things are external tentacles of, of the anointing the man carries. If God doesn't find the man, where is the church? Jesus told Peter, upon this rock I'll build my church. Thou art Simon, and upon this rock. He mentioned the name, then he mentioned the revelation. There is only a church because God has chosen a man and given him a revelation. So how do you claim you are paying money to systems? And I see people say, me, I won't give my tithe to any man of God to chop. I like to give it to the poor. In the Bible, there is categorically stated offerings to be given to the poor. Poor people are not priests. There is no poor people on this wayside who can perform the honor of a priest because the Bible says no man taketh this honor upon himself. So if you give money to the poor, he is not in the rightful place to take your tithe. The tithe is God's money. You don't tell him where you put it and announce to him that made my way into where and In No, that's not how you work with God. Many people do not have the humility with which we pay tithe. That's why they are always crying that the church has exploited them. When I pay the tithe, I am blessing God that he will keep my father alive so that the thing will be beneficial to him. Paul did not want to say it directly. And they forced him. And they said, but if we minister to you in the spirit, you ought to minister back to us in the natural. You know what that means? If I tell you God bless you a thousand times, the only way you can reciprocate that gift is to give me 1,000 CDs. You know, that's the only way. You find it in a mortal currency and turn it to legal and then bring it to me. So pay tithe to a priest. Now you say that the, the, the person is in, the, um, the, the priest is in the church. But fundamentally you know that you are honoring God's chosen, not the system. Has that been helpful? I think our time is up. That's, that's it? Okay. One more question. No, I, I, let yeah. somebody here. Then let a different person, okay? And then... Okay. So this is my own question. <laughs> If we don't okay, stay thank here, you. Yes. So, first, so please, I want to find out where then does the Malachi 310 storehouse comes in? It's all of, after the order of the Levi Levitical priesthood. So, if you are using that blessedness and you say, okay, me, I like to do it, bring the, 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 the tithe to my storehouse that there be meat in my house. What was the meat doing in the house? Who were the people going to use that meat? Go and you realize that God will now specify, give this to the priest and give this to the people who attend. Every money in the kingdom is supposed to be spent by people ordained. So never think that, and say, say, be a No, and say, be That's why the first time there was a preaching. So I'm saying all this because in our bid to be very, very open, we employ some of these blessings or blessed revelations from all the, the places. So there are some good things in the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic order. When you practice it with tithing, it helps you. So you put it to where, you know, the storehouse of God is. Then if you are following that line of argument, then it is the place where you are fed. And where you are fed is most likely the place where, you know, not the, where you are fed is not where you go to church. Where you are fed is where the thing they do benefits you. I don't know how people translate where you are fed to mean where you go to church. If you sit in this church, not this church. If you sit in my church every Sunday and I'm preaching, I'm preaching, and I'm preaching, and you have not gotten to the point to be broken where my, the words I am preaching command a change in your life, you are not being fed here. Your tithe is not needed here. It's not. That's why a lot of people are paying money in church and they are not seeing results and they say God is exploiting them. Where you are fed is not where there is food. It's where you agree to open your mouth to swallow and assimilate. In the abundance of water, the fool is what? So where you are fed is not where there is water or there is food. Where you are fed is where you eat. Not where there is what you want to eat. Many people are in their church. They don't eat what the church serves. And they say that's where they are fed. That's not where you are fed. <laughs> I don't know whether it makes sense. So there are a lot of questions here. So if you, are, if you belong to a church, make sure you are fed there. That means that when they release nourishment, be humble, open up yourself, and let what they are bringing minister to you. But if you are not being fed, your tithe doesn't work here. It does not. So you realize that giving is not simple. 
Now, let me tell you one thing. The only typology or analogy that God used to define giving was agricultural. Are you aware? Yeah. Sowing and reaping is giving. So, all the agricultural principles, how you put a seed in the ground and it germinates and it becomes a harvest, is how giving is. Pe, 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 pe. The seed is correct. The soil is wrong. Cost 90. The seed is not correct. The soil is correct. Cost 90. The seed is correct, but they watered it too much. Cost 90. The seed is correct. The soil is correct. They didn't water it well. Cost 90. The seed is correct, but the soil is rocky. Cost 90. It's just like agriculture. It will shock you that you can be doing a lot of giving and none of them is working. So you pay the tithe to the priest. If your priest is knit to an organization and the principle of the organization is that you pay the tithe to the place, that's fine. You are being modeled by the organization and its leadership. So you can humbly admit to it and then you rise through. But technically, people who have a dimension of revelation, there's a way they move with God and he determines where they are. The, the, the people to whom they owe that spiritual connection, they pay it to. Because the highest form of mentoring is fatherhood, the, 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 the tithe is best when it goes to your father. That's it. Okay. Um, thank you, Apostle. Um, my first question is, um, please, if, if, you, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, use what your pastor teaches you. Hallelujah. Amen. That's why I quote the Bible a lot when I'm giving these things, to tell you that I know what I'm saying from the boundaries of Scripture, not that I have an authoritative opinion. I pay tithe, I do a lot of things that my father tells me, and as how we've been practicing it in a church, it's helpful, except that I'm always taking you to the higher height, so that when argument begin to come from the secular world, you will not be overpowered. Is that okay? Right, so go on. Yes, um, okay. Please, my first question is that, um, can a spiritual father say that I have disowned my spiritual son? And if he should say that, if that is true, then what should a spiritual son who has been disowned do to be able to get another spiritual father? Let's go to First Samuel. Uh, da, 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 da. I hope I will. If I don't find it, I'll just give you some lines. Um, First Samuel chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 20. Never forget this portion of scripture I'm asking you to read. And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness. Yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it had pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in season to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. This answers your question verbatim. You can't disown a son. How dare you? Hey, I... <laughs> Oh my God, I'm sure they will have to edit a lot of things on this thing. Don't put me in trouble, I beg you. Sometimes I'm just relating. <laughs> oh my God, if you look at another place in the Bible, it says, and the strength of Israel cannot lie. You know, these things about the sacred platforms of fatherhood and sonship, it looks to people as, I am not so then you just leave them alone. Sa, sa, sa. On fan as them so hokeke. You could go and ask Samuel. He wept until God came to him and said, Samuel, what are you doing? What are you doing? Me na mifko fa so na mizi mi peni biu. Me enti na what are you And Samuel was still crying. Even when Saul disobeyed God and God said, I found a neighbor of him that's better than leave him alone. Even when Saul begged Samuel to go and do a worship service, he knew it won't change anything, but he went to do it with him. You sit in some place and your hobby is disowning people. Like that. Hey. Your own debut. 
And so you see, you see how Saul put it to the Israelites. He said, hey, it is on record that this nation was so a thing rough. You people, you are stiff naked. And that's how Moses even, you know, christened them. And someone said, it's on record. You have done wickedly, but God says, and then he gets to verse 22. He says, for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. Fatherhood is consequent to the honor of a name that can never be defied. And you choose when to terminate it. How dare you? You can't terminate. You are not permitted to terminate it. You, are, you cannot. That is why abortion is murder. Huh? You don't, you don't know. <laughs> abortion is murder. So you get to the point, they are. What you have done there, I don't want to have anything to do with you again. The best God can ask you to do is to restrain yourself so that you will not be following the sons for them to translate your following as concurrence to their evil. So he will ask you to give them a gap. But you don't have the power to disown anybody that God pushed through your womb. No, sir. No, sir. Before Reuben was cursed, his father called them in Genesis 49. Gather around me, ye sons of Jacob, and hacking unto me, ye sons of Israel. Then he went on. He said, Reuven, the excellency of might and the excellency of dignity. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. But before he cursed him, he acknowledged that you are the excellency of my might and the excellency of my dignity. You are my firstborn, but you have, you have fallen. He didn't say I've disowned you. You cannot. And so when Moses was dying, then he was connected to the patriarchal anointing of Jacob. And he pronounced a remedial, you know, uh, um, tweak on the pronouncement of Jacob on Reuben. And he looked at Reuben and he said, let Reuben live and not die. And let not his men be few. He was doing a remedial thing. The person that Jacob cursed, God did not even forsake Reuben forever. He continued until he got to Moses. And Moses began the repair process with his, you know, prophetic utterances by that dimension. You can't disown anybody. The best God will let you do is to keep a distance so they don't use you to say you are, you are supporting their error. So like Samuel, you tell Saul, I mean like, like Samuel, he tell him, anoint David and stay your cool. And the Bible says, and Samuel never went to see Saul again until, you know, the day of, of his death, of his departure. But every time he was grieving for him, every time he was grieving for him, every time he was grieving for him. And later in life, there are many things that came through Benjamin. Are you aware? Yeah. So disowning is it's a tough thing. The officiating process, you can't reverse it. You cannot. God will just tell you how to deal with it. A lot of people express their frustration. Do you know what it is for a son to betray you? Ministry is the hazarding of the soul. To mentor you, I need to empty my soul into you. So when the father is betrayed, it is very painful. It is destructively painful. So in their frustration, they can utter things, but they don't have scriptural authority. He's genuinely frustrated, but God does not concur his utterances in, in frustrations. And um, that is what happened. So are you aware that even when Absalom died, David wept? Yeah. Even when Absalom died, David wept. It's not easy. When Samuel was crying, he was seeing how Saul would die. And whoa. Like in the literal Akan language. And your carcass will be on the wilderness. And men will have to come and fight to give you an honorable burial. Even your body will be on the, on the field, the peak of ignobility. Men will have to war in order to bring your body home. And someone was looking at it. Massa, for God to disown somebody, eh? in subject the person to wrath and vengeance, you, you cannot wish that for him. The rich man who could look at Lazarus, for Lazarus, somebody with sores, you could look at somebody and uh, dogs are licking his wounds and you will not even give him food. How wicked can you be? 
When this wicked man died and he went to hell, he said, hey, me, I'm wicked though, but for the first time, I will intercede. Oh God, send somebody to warn my brothers. Even he on that selfish level, he said, hell, dear guy, it is better for me to suffer alone. To have my brothers come and suffer like this with me, I won't permit it. When God disowns somebody and wrath begins to play out on their life, it doesn't matter how wicked you are or how much you hated them. When the judgment begins, you will intercede for them, I'm telling you. Because for the heavens to turn their backs on somebody, no, 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 no. Even the rich man interceded in hell. The rich, wicked man, even in hell, he interceded. On earth, he never wanted to suffer alone. But in hell, he said, no, this one is better for me to suffer alone for everybody. In hell, the rich man became an intercessor. So, you can't disown somebody. You cannot. Praise the Lord. I think we should uh, rise and then not be tempted to ask any questions so we can close. Hallelujah. It's been a wonderful experience, I believe. And I know that you have been blessed. Um, before I would say the prayer, I would, I would want to um, do the honors to my father again. And um, sometimes I look back and um, when he was doing what he was doing, he says, oh, do ask for me. I was just trying to give you the best example. Little did he know that I will have to sit in open council for people to ask me questions from all directions. And then men will have to trust that God speaks through me and that the wisdom that I radiate is not of mine, but of the order of that which comes from above. Little did he know. And now I look at myself and I say, wow, if I owe any honor to anybody, I believe that Reverend Nathan Kwesi Yavua is a man I can never forget. No way, no way, no way. I can, I can never forget this man, what he has done for me. And I don't think there's any platform that I will stand on that if I don't acknowledge him, I will have the moral right to talk to anybody. I cannot, there can never be a platform that if I don't tell the world that I owe my maturity to this man, I can never have the moral right to preach anywhere. He, he, if, if, you, if you admire me, there's somebody you must admire first. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. With all, with all seriousness, when we were growing and we were young, I used to ask him questions. And every question I would ask him, then he would give me an answer. Those times when he answers my question, I would clap and laugh loud. I said, I want this kind of level where you sit and you say, ask questions. Little did I know that it would become a reality. Today I'm a guy. And they, and they call me the Iota Apostle. And they say, sir, we want to ask you questions. And I say, ask me any question. <laughs> Praise the Lord, because it's not by mind nor by power, but by the Spirit. I will do you the honors of making him pray for every one of us. But before that, I want my wife to come. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, put your hands together, put your hands together, amen, amen. This is um, Mrs. Emilia Yoboa, aka, I know that one is not part of this one, that one is at, is at home, praise the Lord. If my children were here, they would tell you all the aka and all that, but I believe that aside my father and my mother, and she could not be here because yesterday she was with me and I told her I will mention her name. She asked me, now, who me? And I said, yeah, ma, and then me bow, then you'll be a who? I said, uh -huh, fine, 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 fine. You know, I'm like that with her. She's been a blessing. You know, the woman that pushed Jesus into ministry, her first name was like my mother's first name. She also pushed me into ministry with intercession, like that. And it's very good when we have godly regard for our mothers. So aside my father and my mother, I always want to thank God for Mrs. Emilia Yaboa. With, um, she is my covenant partner. Um, the bond of a spiritual son and a spiritual father is thick, but it is not triune. The bond with a covenant spouse is thick. It is triune, body, soul, and spirit. Your father cannot have biological intercourse with you. Praise the Lord. Uh, so, there is a real... 
Please put your hands together. Go and sit down. <laughs> oh my God. Hallelujah. Wow. I, I think that God has blessed me with my, 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 my wife and she's been a blessing to me. There are many people I, I have to acknowledge friends and brothers and sons and colleagues and some of you who are from afar, you pray for me, you, you ask God to lift me, and there are people that meet me and they say, we are waiting for your rising. And I just go back and I'm humbled. A lot of the times I tell people, you know, I did this um, co um, conference in December when the year is almost waiting, and people were asking me, fatherhood, fatherhood. I said, you know what, to be deep is not bliss. Huh? Yeah. When there is a debt of revelation you carry, there is a realm of humility you need. And that humility does not come except by the play out of certain uncomfortable situations. And so it's not cheap. To be deep is not bliss. But sometimes I'm very much humbled. I struggle to come and tell you these things. And some people think, ah, I just get up and I say what I want. I have my catchy phrases and all that. No, sir. I transact with God over vocabulary. Yeah. I transact with God over vocabulary. There are some things you tell me. You quote a sentence and he says you have the inspirational right to this, but you don't have the moral right. You cannot preach this until after five years when I come back to you. So there are things I know I cannot say because I have not lived them and I have not been tested and tried. So to be deep is not blaze. So some of you who pray for me, you have no idea the investment you are making in my life. No idea. You, 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 it is a critical addition. And like I always tell people, be yourself when you are around me. Me, I don't need to be worshipped. No, idolatry is not reverence. You don't need to worship me. For, from whatsoever distance. Some of you, you admire me, you have your spiritual father. Stay with them. I can be an instructor for, to you. It's okay. That level is okay for me. I can teach you how to love your father with all your, your might. It's okay for me. All I need is that you will be genuine. And whatever God has ordained over your life, it will come to pass in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today I want my father to come and then he will just say one or two things and then pray for all of us so that you will be a beneficiary of the grace that raised me as well. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Apostle, for the opportunity. Um, sometimes I sit there and I marvel artists, you know, uh, expressions and all those things. Little did I know that, that all that I was doing, God was going to use that to produce somebody. There were people I called, nurtured, and ordained them. And when they were leaving, they didn't even have the courtesy to say, Reverend, we are leaving. But now I understand that it was God's divine plan to pave room you know, way for our apostle to emerge. Wow. And I thank God for, for a time like this that is also interacting with you. I can always sit back and foresee that there are challenging times ahead for the church and the black race. But it is my prayer that when that time comes, a people with integrity, sound godliness will rise up and be able to handle the situation. We have failed since 1957 to have people with power, spiritual power, to handle the black race you know, problems. We haven't had them, but and now I'm confident that the generation is rising Amen. and you are the generation. Amen. Someday I'll slump back into my so far and rejoice because there was a people who rise up and with integrity challenge France, challenge America and challenge the world Amen. and make sure that posterity will no, no longer be humbled but that rather they will rise up in dignity because the scripture says Ethiopia shall lift up the hands unto God. Right. Why? Because princes shall rise up out of Egypt. Amen. We have a place in God's eternal Amen. plan. The black race has a place, you know, uh, in God's eternal plan. And it's a plan of what? Glory. You people must rise up Amen. and fulfill that destiny. Father, I thank you for a time like this. I pray from the deepest bowels you have given me Amen. that your grace will sustain these people. Amen. 
and raise them up for a praise unto your name in the generations that are coming. May they never succumb to the beggarly standards of the world, but raise, raise your hand up, raise your power up, raise your glory up, and show forth the word that you have a plan for them, and the plan is good. Lord God Almighty, do good to them. Smile upon them. Show them grace and favor. And in all, unto you be all the glory. Praise, thanksgiving, and worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Okay, God bless you for coming. So I think that